Welcome back everyone to The Charismatic Voice. I'm here today with Tim Faust. Thank you so much for taking time out of a, a very busy schedule to come and chat with me. It's my absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. <laughs> uh, I have to also shout out to Peter Hollins who connected us for this. Um, just really super awesome to actually get to meet you and talk with you. So yeah, thank you. That's really good. First question, tea or coffee? Tea, which is a, a new thing for me. It was a coffee, perhaps too much coffee for way too long. And then a couple of months ago, I decided to just go off coffee completely. Whoa. Um, and so you have introduced me to a whole new world. <laughs> sorry, if, sorry if you have to <laughs> pay for great. that. That was, that was great. I love it. Uh, what kind of tea are you drinking? I went with the Christmas tea. And I'm I'm glad that I get a glimpse of your tree in the background. Um, <laughs> my wife has our house looking like a winter wonderland, so it just felt right. Oh, oh that's perfect. Yeah. Oh. Um, and why did you go off of coffee? Just out of curiosity. I was noticing that when I didn't have it, I was getting headaches. Oh. And that was just a major red flag. Like I don't want you know any kind of dependency. So yeah, sense. it was it was time. <laughs> yeah, which is a bummer because I was like getting super into it. Um, you know, I was starting to like learn about the the regions I enjoy coffee from and the type of roast. And I was like, I was subscribed to a club and everything where I got new coffee every month. Oh, yeah. And then I just pulled the plug on all that. Oh, yeah. yeah. that That is a good present for coffee lovers. I know it's yeah. that time of year and I uh, I know what I'm getting my dad. So, <laughs> Well, let me know if you if your dad needs some. I've I've got some extras now. Oh, <laughs> them that way. <laughs> um, well, that's awesome. I'm glad that the tea timing was was really was good, and that Christmas tree has it does. I love the, the spices in it. They, I don't know. There's yeah. something about it. It's, it's nice. lovely, and it's already gotten like unbearably cold for me. <laughs> I'm envious of you being in Arizona. Uh, oh. So this is also just warming my heart and soul and oh. innards. Yeah, I feel that. <sighs> It gets unbearably cold way too easily in the world. <laughs> yeah, I'm from the deep south, so it's I'm not cut out for winter. You're uh, you were born in Lubbock, right? Yeah, born in, in Lubbock, Lubbock, grew up on the Gulf Coast of Southeast Texas. Didn't see snow till I was 20 years old, <laughs> and now I've seen more snow than anyone ever needs to see in a lifetime. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, Lubbock, it's so funny. I don't think I've actually ever been there. But I have a bunch of relatives that are there. Oh, okay. So I know that my grandma goes back and flies into Lubbock to visit relatives in that area sometimes. So it was kind of cool. Um, and uh, n do you say Nederland? Is That's that pr uh, it. Probably should be Nederland, but we ch we made it Nederland. Nederland. Well, yeah, it's neat. And we don't even really say that. It's sort of just like you know we're Southerners, so we just like, we don't really enunciate. So it's just like Nederland. Nederland. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> yeah. Um how how does it feel to celebrate every February 3rd? <laughs> <laughs> I forget until uh until the home fries remind me, but it's pretty surreal to to have a day. <laughs> a day in your celebration in the town you grew up in. <laughs> yeah. Pretty wild. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Uh do you ever have a moment where you make yourself a pie in your honor? <laughs> I haven't yet, but I might start. Seems like a good excuse. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Or scones or chocolate. I don't know. What would you choose if you're going to make a dessert in your honor? Man, you know, I mean, I'm I'm more of a, a savory over sweet guy anyway, so I might Ooh. just like make a bowl of gumbo or something in my honor. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> wow. Okay. We're going to talk a lot about food too. Just yeah, we because. Are. I've I noticed uh, a lot of food love in previous interviews, so don't worry. <laughs> we'll get there. Um, okay, growing up, you had lots of music at home, right, in school too. What did your mom sing to you? Um, everything. Um, uh, you Are My Sunshine was a big one. Um, there's even a, like a recording on tape, of course, of me singing along with her before I can form words. Yeah, and like matching pitch and stuff. So, yeah. Thanks, Ooh, Mom. Oh, good job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Way to match pitch before you could even speak. Yeah. And um, 
Was that something that was common in your family to sing together before you even went to school? Mostly just uh, for mom. Um, she was always singing and she has a beautiful soprano voice. Um, and so, yeah, we, we were always, there was always music either being played or being sung around the house. Oh, that's super sweet. I grew up with that too. And it's so, it's so wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and then you got into school. Well, I mean, like most kids, you went to school, I guess not got into school, like a college or something, but you went to school and you really got into music. Was it in middle school? You yeah, I mean, it? really going back as far as elementary school, oh. um, I had a music teacher named Miss Dehart, who I'm still close to, and oh. um, she always had me sing a solo in whatever the little you know music productions elementary school kids do, mm -hmm. um, and I never questioned it. It just felt like an assignment. It was like, you do this, you do this, Tim, you sing this <laughs> song here, and I was like, okay. Um, so honestly, as long as I can remember, I've been comfortable on stage and i really oh. owe a debt of gratitude to miss d Hart for making it so thank you miss d Hart. yeah um so you know that was all the way through elementary school and then once i got into middle school i uh, started learning you know solfege and sight reading and all that and mm -hmm. some of the more um fundamentals of singing um as well as you know sort of the, the classical side of it i guess you would say mm -hmm. a little bit more uh, formal training mm -hmm. um Starting in seventh grade, I started competing in uh, all region and those sorts of things in choir. Um, and along with that, once you make it to all region, uh, the school district pays for a voice teacher for you. Oh, so basically, that's nice. I had a voice teacher from seventh grade all the way through high school. Whoa! Yeah, very fortunate, especially yeah, in a place where it's like. Football is the only thing that matters. It's pretty amazing <laughs> that there was like any budget whatsoever for music. So it was cool. Yeah. That's a lot of support for the arts. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And that makes a lot of sense too, because you're using your voice a bunch. You should be taught how to take care of it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I, as you know, I run into people all the time who didn't have that formal training. And a lot of times they, they burn out quick. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It definitely happens. Yeah. Um, so somewhere in there, you found a, a new love for Sondheim, right? Sondheim? Are you talking about Into the Woods? Yeah, of course. I did uh, play the wolf mm -hmm. in Into the Woods. Um, I really just did one, one year of actual theater. Um, it was, let's see, my sophomore year. It's the first time anything like this had ever happened. The um, the music program, specifically the choral program, got together with the band program and the drama program and decided to put on uh, put on a production of Grease. Um, and it went beyond that. I mean, we got like some twirlers involved, and it was like we tried to get everybody involved from all over the school. Um, and it was after that that I kind of like had the bug for a little bit more than just singing, um, you know. And then some of the other students were kind of twisting my arm to come be a part of drama. Uh -huh. uh, so my senior year, I finally joined up and, and did Into the Woods, but just straight up like play version, no singing. I, I It's so good. I love it. it. It's just so good. If people haven't seen Into the Woods, they need to see Into the Woods. But were you normally a really good, uh, good student at that point? I mean... I, I got good grades, but I lacked in uh, the motivation area. Okay. So I, I have heard the story of, I think, how you got kicked out. Was uh, it kicked yeah. out or just suspended? But uh, it's so funny that I really want you to tell it again. <laughs> Let's do it. Um, well, for anyone who hasn't seen Into the Woods, um, you know, it's kind of like, a combination of a bunch of different uh, fairy tales and such. And I played the big bad wolf. Uh, so I get killed off pretty early in the play. Um, mm. And, you know, so I am and them just like left alone. And which is never a good idea. You know, I should be supervised <laughs> at all times. And, <laughs> Especially in high school. And I'm sitting then like in the drama classroom, which has two giant windows on the doors uh, I'm just hanging in there basically with like the techies and then everyone else in the play 
is rehearsing the part where everybody's like chanting the same lines over and over and over again together into the woods to find a friend. And so it's like every cast member but me is out in this common area facing back towards these two doors with giant windows and the drama teacher is sitting between us but facing them and I wasn't going to miss that opportunity. Nope. So I I <laughs> I mooned my cast castmates. I just applaud you so much I was that. just <laughs> testing their professionalism. Turns out they had none. They all <laughs> broke. <laughs> like, come on, guys. The show has to go on. What? Absolutely. Anything could happen in performance. Gotta keep your game face right? on. <laughs> Gotta keep on. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So were you, were you actually kicked out or was it just a day or a couple days? No, it was a couple of weeks. I was, I was sent oh. to the alternative campus, some oh small building with no windows. Yeah. Was it worth it? Absolutely. <laughs> I, I mean, it ended up being like a weird little vacation of sorts. Um, you know, no disrespect to any of the folks that work at the alternative campus, but they're sort of glorified babysitters. It's mm -hmm. they're not they're not really equipped to really instruct students. So it almost became like a whole uh, um, Shawshank Redemption scenario where <laughs> they realized I was good at math, and so I ended up like tutoring all the kids over there at the alternative campus who like were doing any sort of advanced math whatsoever. Oh man. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then you did their taxes and funneled. Things yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Oh man. <laughs> it's so good. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's a pretty epic story. Yeah. I can't believe that is, that has followed me for 30 years. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's legendary. Of course, it's been a volume. I love it. Love it, love it. Um, do you still sing any Sondheim? You know what? My um, musical theater knowledge is pretty limited, to be honest with you. Uh, I enjoy it. I mean, anytime I'm uh, in New York, I try to catch a Broadway show. Mm. Um, but I didn't, you know, that that wasn't really on my radar when I was growing up too, too much. Yeah. yeah. I I would love to hear you sing The Wolf sometime. That is such a fun role. It's so spicy, funny. It's just, I, I feel like that must be one of the most uh, enjoyable roles to perform in the entire show. So Absolutely. And you're trying to do, you know, like a family friendly version of it too, mm -hmm. you know, because you're in school. So it's, you're always walking that fine line with that role. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's fun we so, didn't go full anatomical like some of the versions oh yeah Woo, some of them are <laughs> amazing yeah. <laughs> that's so funny but if you ever decide to do a recording of that uh, just know that i will be the first in line okay get it. i'm always looking for new and interesting outside the box ideas for stuff <laughs> so it could happen yes yes that one um so i got to know you first through home free right sure. and that's that's more of the wheelhouse of a lot of the songs that you sing now is more in the country vein right um but it was man of constant sorrow and i i mean it sounded great it sounded fantastic thank you really, so much oh of course you're welcome thank you and thank you great. for you know exposing uh home free to a whole new generation of audience members so i really appreciate that oh of course of course yeah. um i feel like it's, it's just, uh, I feel really lucky to be able to find or discover awesome singers and share that with other people on YouTube. It's amazing. What a wonderful thing that I get to do. So getting to do that is, uh, yeah, it's wonderful. That's Thanks. really cool that you do that. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm curious, uh, there is this big gap of time that I don't know a whole lot about in your life from essentially, I know you went to, you were going to do dental school and then you went into music and there's about a decade in there before you joined up with Home Free. And I'd love to ask you a little bit about it. I know you did a solo album in there. Um, I think you might have sung with some other groups too. Can yeah. you kind of fill in that gap of knowledge for me? Absolutely. Um, yeah, when I graduated high school, um, a, I was a little bit burnt out on music because I'd done it so much. I mean, I'd done anything 
you could do vocally in high school. Mm. Um, and then on top of that, I was sort of just ignorant in, uh, as to the opportunities that are out there for vocalists. Um, you know, you have to remember this is like in the early days of the internet. So uh, I think I was still, you know, asking Jeeves things. I don't know if you <laughs> even remember that at all, but. I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all the kids watching will have to Google ask Jeeves. Oh my God. Ironically, but. <laughs> um, you know, there just wasn't a ton of information out there. And, you know, I came from a small town. Uh, I thought, you know, you either went on Broadway, you got a record deal and that was about it. Um, and I also had heard that the music industry industry was scary and fickle. Um, so I thought, all right, I'll go get a normal, stable, lucrative job. So I, my plan was to be an orthodontist. And, uh, so I, I went to uh, Lamar University in Beaumont, Texas for a couple of years as a pre-dental major. Uh, never found any more ambition or diligence as a student along the way. So a couple of years in, I was like, yeah, this is, this kind of stinks. Maybe I should look into that music thing. Um, and so I ended up finding some early acapella message boards and uh and found a group that was starting up in minnesota for some reason acapella groups hate warm weather except for voice play and they've already got a great bass so i keep finding myself in these frigid tundras um <laughs> minnesota <laughs> yeah and it, honestly that's probably a credit to uh, an incredible group called the blenders i don't know if they're on your radar at all oh. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh -huh. but I think they sort of started a bit of the acapella boom in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. Um, and so at the time it was a group called blue Jupiter that was forming. Um, it was, uh, three guys from Berkeley college of music. They were all graduating. Uh, and then me with like, for the most part, not a lot of like real book smarts when it, when it comes to music. I mean, apart from, like I said, just basic sight reading, Mm -hmm. um, meanwhile, they're all graduating with music degrees. So they spoke this whole language that was just foreign to me. Mm -hmm. um, so I had to kind of play catch up quick um, on my music knowledge. Uh, I just had a low voice, thankfully, and they couldn't find anyone that had a low voice. So it's I hard to up. find a really good bass. I learned that early on. If you're <laughs> if you're a, a good bass, you probably won't ever need a gig if you want one. Um, but uh, I moved up there. Um, ended up doing that for a couple of years, learned that starting a band is really hard. Yeah. Um, and even though we had a plan in place that was supposed to give us a bit of a head start, um, just learning how to do the thing takes a while, you know, to develop your sound, um, of course, work on stage presence and putting together an actual show and all of those mm -hmm. things just didn't occur to us. So it, it took a long time, um, to find, find that rhythm. Um, and so, yeah, I did that for uh, a couple of years. Uh, we ended up releasing an album called ear candy, which to this day I'm super proud of. Um, oh. it kind of made a splash <laughs> in the acapella world. Um, you know, suddenly all the acapella enthusiasts like knew who I was because I was this new young bass singer. Um, incidentally, I never pieced these things together, but like my big solo on that album was uh, Little Red Riding Hood. <gasps> So I guess the legacy has followed me. It has. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's funny. But yeah, you know, so like a year into that, when it wasn't quite taken off the way we had hoped, um, you know, and I'm just like eating into savings. And I mean, honestly, my, my poor mother is just funding my little passion project, essentially. Mm. Um, 
I thought, you know what, I'll give this another year. Uh, in, in a year from now, if we've got some traction, great. Um, if not, I want to at least have made some contacts in the industry and I want to have an album, you know, with my name, face, voice, uh, an original. I'd like to have that out there. Um, and if, and if, if I got all that, I can move on and be happy with what we've accomplished. And that's kind of what, what ended up happening. Um, uh, a year later, uh, you know, things were picking up, but we still were a long ways away from supporting ourselves. But yeah. like I said, that album Ear Candy had made a splash. Um, I had done a lot of networking. Uh, I had uh, auditioned for Rockapella even. Oh. As like a 20 year old kid, I had no business <laughs> doing it. But I mean, I was like one of four finalists considered to replace Barry Carl, which was crazy. And I think Not that was surprising. like a big wake up call for me as well. It's like, oh, okay, I am marketable in this arena. Um, and so, uh, I, uh, auditioned for another group called ball in the house. Um, and they told me that, uh, that they would probably be, be needing a bass singer sometime in the following year. Um, they thought mm -hmm. their, their bass would be retiring. I auditioned as a baritone actually, oh. cause that was the spot that was open. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of excited about singing something other than than bass because I'd just been doing that full time for two years. Mm -hmm. um, and so they were like, yes, yeah, so I think our bass is going to retire sometime in like, you know, six to nine months. So, you know, if you can hold off till then, we'd love to have you as a bass and hire this other guy as a baritone. I said, all right, that's fine. Oh, cool. So I went and took my first cruise ship gig. <gasps> yeah. Uh, so I signed that's on to a, a six month contract on celebrity cruises, mm -hmm. um, which is like a makeshift acapella group three other guys i didn't know mm -hmm. um doing a wide variety of stuff from like barbershop to some modern things a lot of doo-wop things like mm -hmm. that um and then three months into the six-month contract ball in the house called me in a panic and said hey our base like just retired we need you like now oh man i was like i'm in aruba uh, <laughs> <laughs> but i called the production company and i was like you gotta send me anybody like literally any voice part, because we had another guy in the group who had a good range, and he and I were already trading off on the bass stuff. So I was like, send me whoever you can find, and I'll, ch I'll teach them whatever part I need to. And uh, they ended up sending me a high tenor. And so I, uh, and I was singing a bunch of high tenor stuff too. I was like singing all the parts. Um, and so uh, we taught him my parts, uh, taught the other bass guy the rest of my bass parts, and off I went to uh, to Boston, Massachusetts, where I, spent three years um for the first time getting a taste of making a living singing acapella music yeah that's awesome <laughs> yeah that was a long answer to a to a short no, question no but um, i wanted a, a long answer because okay. yeah I, I feel like there's a lot of time in between there where i had names and a few dates but how that happened just the pieces yeah. were linking together, so that was perfect. Yeah, I was in Boston from 2003 to 2006. Um, and, and like I said, um, you know, the, the cruise ship was a, was a great gig. You, you don't get paid that, that well your first time out there. But it was, that was like my first steady paycheck, um, you know, and you're getting to see the world. And, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. But then once I got to Boston, that's the first time I got a taste of like actually being able to support myself on land, you know, mm -hmm. pay bills and things like that. Um, and I got to sing contemporary acapella music, which was which was like my first love. Well, doo-wop and gospel acapella is probably the real first love. But, you know, like the first time I heard rock acapella, <laughs> that's when I was like mind blown. Totally. Didn't know that was even a thing, you know, with a full-time beatboxer and the whole deal. Right. Um, basically the formula that everyone is doing now, you know, they were doing 30 plus years ago. Yeah. Um, and so I got to do that really for the first time with Ball in the House and make a good living doing it. And uh, yeah, I was pretty hooked at that point. So that takes us up to about 2006, right? But yeah. But three was 2010 slash 2012. Yeah. Still got a few years there. Yeah. What's in that gap? Yeah. So I did Ball in the House for for about three years. And then I wondered if maybe, 
you know, it was like music was out of my system or something or not, not music, but just living out of a suitcase. I mm-hmm. wondered if that was out of my system. Um, cause they toured hard. I mean, we did 250 shows a year. Um, Whoa. yeah, we were doing a lot of educational stuff too. So sometimes yeah. we'd, we do like three educational performances in a day, you know, like going to a school and do like mm-hmm. morning, midday and afternoon assembly. And then sometimes that night also doing an evening concert. So it was like the grind. I mean, yeah, you know, it's, it's hard to complain about too much work. You know, and especially coming from wishing there were more work. I mean, it was mm-hmm. an absolute blessing, but it was it was no joke. Um, and so I ended up retiring from Ball in the House and going back home to Southeast Texas and uh, and substitute teaching for a year. Yeah, <laughs> what yeah, were you teaching math. Yeah, mostly. I mean, it was whatever awesome. they whatever they needed me to, but it was all high school and I preferred math whenever I could. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did that for about a year. Got a call from the production company that I had worked uh, through to get on Celebrity. And uh, they had just gotten a deal with uh, Crystal Cruises, which is kind of like the, the top of the top mm-hmm. uh, ultra luxury. And they were trying to put together like a super group based – on their favorite vocalist that they had ever had in the past. Wow. And so uh, I was the bass they called and they kind of twisted my arm into going and, and doing uh, Crystal Cruises, um, which even that was eye opening because on Celebrity, we had no uh, um, perks, like no status whatsoever. You know, we slept in the bowels of the ship. Um, if we weren't working, they didn't really too much want you out and about. We were never allowed in the dining room, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Whereas Crystal is like the swankiest gig. I mean, we were we could do anything we wanted. We got like guest cabins with verandas over the ocean. What? I mean, it was wild. Yeah. They call it a six-star cruise line. Every night is just the the best food I've ever tasted in my life, which is probably why I'm now such a food enthusiast. Um <laughs> And so I did that. I did one uh, regular contract on a ship, and then I did one world cruise, which is a 108-day cruise Whoa. that started in L.A. and basically just went west zigzagging for 108 days until it ended up in Dover, England, um, a literal world cruise. Um, so, amazing. yeah, after touring with uh, Blue Jupiter and Ball in the House, uh, around the U.S. and then doing uh, Celebrity and Crystal Cruises, I had managed to make it to all 50 states and all seven continents before I turned 30. <laughs> wow, that that is some life goals achieved yeah. in a short period of time. Yeah. Whoa. And so I thought like, okay, maybe I've done it. Maybe I did the thing, you know, like I supported – Myself, you know, I was in a band that was supporting Mm -hmm. families by making music. I've traveled all over the country, all over the world. Um, And again, I was like sort of sick of living out of a suitcase. Mm -hmm. And so I went back to Texas again, substitute taught for maybe another year and was thinking like, maybe I'll go back to school and get a education degree or something. Um, I ended up uh, producing some ship, uh, some, uh, groups for crystal cruises as well for that Mm -hmm. production company. So I was still kind of getting a taste of it. Um, and then a group called the alley cats got in touch with me. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, when I was in ball in the house, we shared an agent with the alley cats Mm -hmm. and, uh, all these groups are still around, by the way, blue Jupiter is still around ball in the house is still around and the alley cats are still around. Um, the alley cats are interesting and that they have this wide arsenal of talent. They don't necessarily, you know, have a set group of guys that are on the poster. Um, so they'll just book like three shows on the same day in different parts of the country and then worry about oh. filling it with personnel afterwards. Um, so that keeps it really interesting too, because I've literally met guys moments before we have started singing together. Um, if you, if you know your part and you kind of generally know how the show goes and, um, it's, it's a comedic tribute to the music of the fifties and Mm sixties. Um, so that was the first time to kind of getting, uh, a taste of 
not necessarily having a script, kind of having a guide, but those guys are fearless and, and, um, there's a lot of ad living. They call themselves the group that heckles back. Um, <laughs> so that's when I just that's learned good. the joy of just that sort of flexibility and having fun and spontaneity with the audience, um, which is certainly carried over into what I do today. Did you ever find people when you were doing that, that you felt just an instant click with, right? You know, you go out and, and like you said, meet them right before you go on stage. Did you ever find a, someone that you felt like total stranger, but maybe you'd known their voice forever, that your voice is just fit together. Absolutely. I would say that the, a couple of the guys I sang with on the first Alley Cat gig I ever did. And that was the cool thing about them too, is like, it was, I didn't have to make any sort of commitment. They would just call and say, Hey, we've got these two weeks at the Miami Dade County fair. Do you want to go do it? I'm like, heck yeah, I want to do it. Um, and that group of guys was so unbelievably talented and overqualified um, <laughs> that I was like, wow, this is really fun. If this is the caliber of singers in the Alley Cats, then yeah, I'll keep, I'll keep doing this. Especially because mm -hmm. like I said, it wasn't, it wasn't a commitment. Um, one of them is now the lead singer of a Journey tribute band. Oh. And he's unreal. I mean, he actually sounds like Steve Perry. That's crazy. And that's maybe the most vocally demanding gig I can think of is having to do like <laughs> 90 minutes of journey. Um, uh, yeah. But what was so refreshing about them is how they didn't take themselves seriously. You know, <laughs> uh, all the groups I was coming from, we took ourselves very seriously. I mean, we were passionate about what we were doing, you know, but it was like, we were trying to be artists. And this group is just like, we're just having fun and making music, making fun of ourselves, making fun of the audience. And I was hooked at that point. Um, and so again, I, I was kind of doing a few gigs with those guys, but then I'd go back, substitute teach, maybe go do a, some Christmas shows, go back, substitute teach. And then this, I get this call from this independently wealthy fella in Southern California at a time when I seriously thought there was nothing that could make me get back into music full time. <laughs> and he says, this group called the Alley Cats tells me that you're a phenomenal writer. I'm looking to form a writing team in Southern California. I'd like to fly you out here, see if we gel together writing, um, and then we can go from there. I was like, okay, what do I have to lose? I'll go hear this guy out. So I fly out to Southern California. We do gel well. And he says, okay, here's the deal. I'll give you a house to live in. Whoa. My own house in Orange County, California. I'll give you a car to drive and I'll pay you a salary to write whatever you want to write. And if it's good, you can go into this $2 million facility and cut it with the best session players in Southern California. And I was wow. like, I can't say no to that. <laughs> no, you can't you know, say no. It was, I think, literally the one call that could have gotten me back into full-time music. And honestly, I've kind of been back in ever since. Uh, mm -hmm. So I went out there. Uh, he also just kind of let me hire my buddies. All, all these talented guys I knew who needed gigs, we just brought them out there and we formed this little collective. Um, and we spent a few years just like collaborating together and writing stuff. Um, that's where my solo country album came from. It was just it. stuff I was writing already. And then after a while, we had enough to put together an album. Um, during that time, Home Free got in touch with me and uh, I had sort of gained a reputation in the acapella community of a guy who had access to a lot of different talent um, just from all the groups I had sung with, as well as producing so many groups for uh, cruise ships and stuff. So they called me looking for a bass singer for their very first tour they were going to do. Um, they also had part time jobs and uh, but they they had they were going to do a six week allied tour in the Midwest. And I gave them a, a bunch of names and uh, none of that panned out. And they said, is there any possible way we could convince you to come do this tour with us? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I want to be, I don't like, I got to talk to this guy I'm working for. And then they said, well, I'll tell you what, if you, we know you've got this solo thing going now, if you come out with us, we will, 
learn one of your songs, perform a Tim Faust original in the show and promote and let you sell your solo at the time EP on the tour with us. Oh, and the guy cool. I was working for thought that was a great idea. Yeah. Um, so I went and did the very first home free tour um, and sort of had forgotten how fun that was. And again, it was that like contemporary acapella thing again. Mm -hmm. And uh, at this point, I'm like, I can't really ignore like how good that feels to do this thing. Um, again, they were part time. So uh, they went back to their jobs. I went back to Southern California, kept doing my thing. Fast forward like six months. Now they have a Christmas tour. They're like, will you come do our first Christmas tour? So I went and did that. Um, and yeah, we sort of just left it with, I tell you what, you guys let me know when A, you're full time, and B, it's not a prerequisite that I live in Minnesota. <laughs> 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 it's too cold. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, it almost kills me every year. But uh, so they, yeah, I mean, we that that's kind of where we left it. They hired another guy for a while. And then um, once they were really ready to go full time and they could justify letting me live in the South, they called me up and uh, and it coincided with with a time when I was sort of ready to move on from that chapter in Southern California. And I've been doing home free ever since. That's awesome. Yeah. So in Southern California, was that mostly Los Angeles or San Diego or? Uh, right between them, uh, near oh. Anaheim. Oh, got it. Yeah. yeah. So more Orange County. Got yeah. yeah. Um, Irvine. Uh, yeah, 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 very close to Irvine. Brea yeah. specifically. Oh, we'll see. There we go. Did you go to the Brea Tar Pits? We'll see. That's La Brea, and that's up near oh. LA. So this is like another city called Brea, which is Irvine. yeah down south. But I have been to the Tar Pits. Yeah. I lived in LA for quite a while and never went to the tar pits and I regret it. You still can. I will go back and go to them at some point. <laughs> um, and then at that point, um, did you end up moving out to Nashville after that? I didn't. Um, I moved to Dallas for about a year. Um, a girl I was dating at the time had a job offer there and, wow. you know, it was drivable to my family who I'd been away from, you know, for most of the last 10 years. Um, so I was excited about being closer to home. Uh, it was an easy flight from Dallas up to Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So did that for a little bit. Yeah. Before I, before I ended up in Nashville. I feel like the taste for good food was started on the cruise line. That sounded like it began there, but I really think that SoCal has got amazing food that's happening. I don't know about Dallas as much. Um, I would guess that there's great food. There, Dallas but. has killer food as well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've, I've always loved food. Um, you know, and then once I started like making money, I could start to research like better food. Um, but I also didn't realize what like an art form cooking really could be until I right. got on crystal cruises. And then I was like, Whoa, I need more of this in my life. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, a few years back, uh, I quit drinking altogether and then I just went all in on food. <laughs> it's like food's my vice now. That's amazing. Yeah. That's, so you, you mentioned in another interview that you just love food network. If you had a different career in life, it'd be hosting a show, I think on food network. Was that? I would love that. Yeah. Right. Um, so I had, I, uh, was chatting with a, a friend of ours Gavin and my husband, all three of us love Chopped. And we came up with a really fun question for you. Okay. <laughs> so have you seen Chopped? Uh, I have seen a little bit of it, not too much, but I, I know the concept, yeah. Right, where that people get a basket of mystery ingredients and they're supposed to construct a meal. They get a basket for an appetizer, a basket for the main course, a basket for dessert. So... Um, they helped come up with a list of ingredients. We had the appetizer, the main, and the dessert. Uh, would you prefer maybe the main? Or I know you, you said you liked, uh, liked salty more than sweet. So uh, is I mean, I should particular... specify, I do, a, I do some cooking. I'm by no means an expert chef at all. I, I, would, I would more, if I were going to host a show, it would be more along the lines of me just 
eating a lot. <laughs> but uh, but we can try this, sure. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna toss some ingredients at you then. Um, okay. Do you want to make the appetizer, the main, or the dessert? Let's go appetizer. Appetizer. Okay. So your ingredients are gonna be blue crab, leeks, pink peppercorns, and candied pecans. Okay. Um, what do you want to come up with? Uh, I might do like a, yeah, like a, a crab Benedict or something like that. That's like one of my favorite things in the world is when you can get creative with like a breakfast seafood option. Whoa. So I'd probably do like a, yeah, like a Cajun crab Benedict. What? That sounds like so much fun. Would you sprinkle those pecans on top? And get Absolutely. Like a yeah. yeah, for sure. <sighs> Yeah. Oh my goodness. That that answer definitely surpassed <laughs> the, what I, I had imagined. Oh, maybe like a crab cake of some sort, but that sounds kind of normal. No, crab Benedict. <sighs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. Yeah, I, I feel like you would do very well. <laughs> but again, I would still prefer to eat it rather than make it myself. Yeah, you're going to be the judge. Yeah. No, that sounds like a good a good position. And I've done like a little bit of that sort of thing. I'm sort of the the food guy in Home Free now. We, um, in addition to all the music videos release, uh, we release we do a lot of behind the scenes videos and kind of focus on each of our hobbies and passions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm the food guy, so there are a few videos out there on YouTube of me of me eating. So if that's <laughs> your thing, go check it out. Um, this is probably the dish that is the most Southeast Texas of all the dishes. What we have here is a boudin omelet smothered in crawfish etouffee. <laughs> what did you say? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, obviously the Cajun influence is huge here on the Gulf Coast. It's my favorite food of all time and uh, being, being a foodie with a focus on breakfast enthusiasm. This right here takes the cake. <laughs> we did just release a video of me eating too, but <laughs> that was all about how various food relates to voice and vocal folds and how being pregnant makes you have lots of weird cravings. So <laughs> um, I would love to know what is your top meal you've ever had or even top dish? Like what is a 11 out of 10 that the most perfect thing you've ever eaten? Um, well, my uh, favorite chef in Nashville curated an 18 course feast for my 40th birthday so it's hard to top that um, <laughs> wow yeah yeah uh wow as far as me picking like one single thing that i would have to eat you know if i was going to pick one thing to eat for the rest of my life um in the south for thanksgiving we do uh dressing instead of stuffing uh-huh and uh, my mom makes this cornbread dressing <laughs> that is probably my favorite thing in the world to eat. So it's got cornbread in it. What else? Oh, it's got all kinds of stuff. It's got cornbread. It's also got like toast. It's got um, a bunch of veggies. It's got celery. And, uh, you know, I was just telling her uh, I didn't get to go down there for Thanksgiving this year. And I was very much so missing it. Uh, next year will be my, my year to get down there. I do every other year. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm like, I got to learn how to make this cornbread dressing so I can serve it to my Yankee in-laws on yeah. the off years. <laughs> I feel like they'll be forever changed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've made a few things and I, they're just, I don't think they know what to make of my Southern cuisine. <laughs> I, my husband makes a cornbread stuffing, but there's sausage in it too and, and a little bit of cranberry. So yeah. it's that's crazy good yeah 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 that, that can be real good i didn't know yeah. that the dressing slash stuffing could actually be the best part of the meal it's the it's always the main as far as i'm concerned main event <laughs> yes exactly yeah. well um i have to say uh, it's really fun hearing that trajectory and also hearing that it was the alley cats that made you uh become a little more improvisational and, and more loose and have fun. Because loose cannon, I think is the term you're looking for. They made me a loose cannon on stage. <laughs> they, they made you a loose cannon. Uh, because I feel like I got to see that 
when you did the hillbillies versus zombies thing with voice play. Wow. Yeah. That's, <laughs> what a callback, uh, right? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I laughed so hard. I laughed so very hard. Uh, can we expect another collaboration with voice play sometime? It certainly could happen. I mean, in the home free world, um, these days we try to stay in the country lane mm -hmm. as much as possible. Um, you know, we've got a big team of people around us and they're big on sticking to a vision. Um, so, uh, we're, we're kind of in the, in the country lane. So most of the time, if we collaborate with somebody, it's going to be a country artist. Um, but I've continued to do stuff with, with voice play. Um, yeah, I've done a couple things with them now. I did some kind of I don't remember even what it was for, but it was just, the song was just called Sing mm -hmm. um, and, or just Sing. Uh, and they were raising money for, for something. And it was just like all of these incredible artists. So that was a real pleasure to be a part of that. Yeah. Um, and I've done some stuff for Patty Cake Productions as well, which is oh, yeah. a current and former voice play member. So yeah, I mean, I'm sure you'll see more collaborations like that down the line, but it's not, it's not, out of uh, the realm of possibility to see another home free voice play collab at some point. We love those guys. What did you do with Patty Cake? Um, uh, it was like a, it was like a villains, Disney a villains, villains cover? like cover thing. <laughs> so they were like, "Hey, can you do a really hillbilly version of of a Disney villain song?" And I'm like, "Absolutely." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> check yeah awesome. <laughs> yeah i really dig what they do too did uh did jeff tell you the origin of the zombies versus hillbillies how that came about i've heard a little bit of it um also from lane but uh, sure. i would love it expanded upon so that came out of the sing-off um we were on season four of the sing-off with voice play and Every week, uh, everybody would have to arrange a version of some pop song uh, to use as the battle song in the event that you were in the bottom two. And so, uh, like, fortunately for us, we were, we were never in the bottom two, but every week we were still, like, arranging these songs, and then they would pair you with every single group, and you would rehearse, like, what your battle would look like. Whoa. Um, and so one week, theoretically, if we were in the bottom two, it was going to be Survivor. And, uh, and we had so much fun with that voice play pairing that after the show, we were like, we got to bring that back. And then yeah. they came up with the, with the concept of zombies versus hillbillies. Surviving. Hey, I'm wishing you the best. Pray that you are blessed. Bring you much success, the stress, and lots of happiness. I'm better than that. I'm not gonna bless you on the radio. I'm better than that. I'm not gonna lie to you, you baby. I'm <laughs> <laughs> wow okay so i think we have like earl versus tim right now those are your two main vocalists that are taking center stage at the moment i love the low notes from tim and also the way he's like yeah let's go around let's go let's it's amazing it's so good it's just it is pure gold i love our it. part was not too much of a stretch for us <laughs> oh yeah it, it uh it definitely worked and uh on on the sing-off I, I was going to ask you about nerves and how you deal with that and pressure, but I guess I would kind of shift that to say, um, have you ever struggled with pressure? Because it seems like through your career, you're, you're pretty chill and you haven't, you've been singing in lots of groups and had lots of shows. So I don't know if there ever was a chance to develop any sort of real stage fright. Um. Not too much, to be honest with you. I did experience a little bit um, episode one of the sing-off. Huh. It always catches me off guard because I, it's <laughs> so foreign to me. Mm -hmm. So when it happens, it's like, what is this I'm feeling? I'm like, oh, this is probably stage fright. <laughs> um, and so that, again, that kind of caught me off guard. Now, when I was, uh, you know, starting in middle school, I was obsessed with boys to men. And then got to high school and really fell in love with Jules' music. Oh. And then 
uh, sort of end of high school and then like into my early adulthood, like Ben Folds became my favorite like modern artist. It started out, Billy Joel is my all time favorite, but of the people who are still like releasing original music to this day, like Ben Folds is my number one. I love so, Ben Folds. I'm right there with you. All of a sudden, like I'm about to perform for all the, well, they're anticipating 10 million viewers too. <laughs> and then on top of that, three icons whom I greatly admire. So it kind of got to me a little bit, that first episode. <laughs> um, but then once we got through that one, it was, it was smooth sailing after that. So when it got to you, uh, what happened? Not too much. I mean, I would say it might have even been a little bit of like healthy nerves or something. Yeah. You know? More like I can excitement have a little, rather than fear. I can have a little bit of a resting bitch face. So <laughs> I'm sure those nerves probably uh, helped chilling. me when it came to live television. <laughs> yeah, it does make you hyper aware of every <laughs> single facial reaction you might be having. Yeah. Unless you do a lot of YouTube videos and then you just are normal all the time and silly and have wild facial reactions and don't know it. But. That's what keeps them coming back. <laughs> that and the swords. That and the swords and hopefully awesome vocal knowledge. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> I got to say, awesome. by the way, it's really refreshing to, uh, to hear your take on uh, all the things you react to, okay. you know, because there's a lot of... Uh, amateurs out there and not knocking them it's cool to just watch you know any any old folk mm -hmm. just enjoy music as well but it's also nice to hear a really uh, informed approach to it so thank you for that well thank you and it it is delightful every single time i've heard you uh, uh including recently when i got to hear a little bit of uh some stuff that's coming up so uh can we talk a little bit about layering of just you in an all vocal album absolutely <laughs> um, okay so that just to make sure i don't say anything that i shouldn't say can you introduce it for sure yeah i have a, an album coming out which is uh, called pieces of me volume one and it's all doo-wop stuff from the 50s and 60s uh, and it's all acapella and it's all me <laughs> and hopefully by the time this airs it'll be uh, available for either order or pre-order. So come go with me. Wow, 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 wow. Yes, I need you. Yes, I really need you. Please say you'll never leave me. They say you'll never know you really never. Never give me a chance. Come, 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 come into my heart. I am pre-ordering one for sure. <laughs> well, you get a or free ordering. one. Whatever you is get available. A, you, you get a complimentary copy for sure. <laughs> well, I'll order an extra one and send it to my mom. Okay, we'll do Absolutely. that too. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and it was so fun to hear this because I know you've done layering of your voice and and various things before, but hearing just you on all of the parts, it was so cool to hear that entire range explored and and several songs and with different kinds of, of timbres and, and fun approaches. It was just, it was really fun. So can I ask you a couple things about your technique? Um, yeah, especially I mean, you're, you're gonna find out real quick how technically ignorant I am, but let's try this. <laughs> well, there's, but there are some things you do that I, I wonder, yeah, it's always curious to me. Some people are naturally talented, but when you've been doing it for so long and so reliably, there's often a sensation or something that you hook into, right? Where you say, that's when I know that it's good. So um, let's just talk about low notes first, right? That's sure. one of the things that is, I think, one of the most attractive things immediately for most people about your voice is when you drop into this big, boomy low, people love it. I get a little goofy when I hear it because I think it's really fun. <laughs> so what does the best kind of low note feel like to you? Um, wow. Um, I don't know as far as just like when I'm recording now, you know, there's a, there's a certain, you know, range that when you do it live and with the right sound system in the right hall, you know, when it rattles the audience as well as you on stage, 
there's something uh, special about that for sure. Right. When it's a little bit seismic, then that, then that's good. Yeah. When we're all, yeah. When it's like, it becomes like a 4D show at that point, you know, we're all like <laughs> experiencing the note together. Right. Oh, yeah. I, I love that. I just absolutely love it when. Yeah. I, I mean, I do too. Belly shaking I do too. What? I almost feel like I willed myself into being a bass singer. Um, I grew up on like acapella gospel music, mm -hmm. um, specifically the group called acapella um, and the acapella company, which is kind of the larger umbrella. Um, my mom and aunt played me a lot of that stuff. And then my grandma played me Southern gospel. And both of those genres have just the freakiest low basses. That fortunately <laughs> for me, very few people know about. Everyone thinks like I'm this anomaly. Um, but there's like some killer bass singers, uh, in the gospel world. And, um, and I was like, I want to do that. Yeah. But I was, a, I was a, such a late bloomer. I mean, I had a squeaky high voice well into high school, really? like well after all my peers. Yeah. Um, so I and almost like wonder if, if I just willed myself into being the bassy bad wolf or something. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you have maintained an amazing ability to access your highs. And a lot of times one of the things I hear low voices do where it gets a little scary, where they're going to burn out or just do some, ah, just not have as much longevity in the career sure. or in the voice is when they take that massive low sound and then they go up and they just try and stack it like that. Yeah. And when you go up, you, you are bringing your sound more focused, a little more narrow a lot of times. And, and you get up into ranges of a tenor. And I mean, obviously you said you're singing high tenor <laughs> in the cruise too. And the thing is like, I've heard, I've heard basses do that before. That's not, that's not a, as big of a deal. It can be done well, but you sometimes sound like a high tenor. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was a conscious uh, choice. I, wanted to be able to sing high stuff without sounding like a bass trying to sing high stuff. Um, Bingo. and I had heard, you know, a few, but a couple of guys that did that where you almost couldn't believe it was them, mm -hmm. you know, where it's like, how is that the same guy doing that? Unless I see it, it's almost hard to believe. And I wanted to be one of those guys. <laughs> yeah. I dig that. I totally dig that. Um, you and you're also doing some teaching about how you do this as well, right? Yeah, I offer uh one on one bass workshops via Zoom uh, through my website, which is timfaustmusic.com, and that's been really fun as well to kind of impart you know some of this wisdom I've picked up along the way about how to do this odd thing that I do. So, what's that? What's a tip that you would give to somebody who's really working on low notes? How do you open them up a little bit more? I always say the first thing I want you to do is stop worrying about singing low and work on the other end of your range. Oh, wow. Because I work with dudes all the time and I'm like, how often do you sing in your falsetto? And 90% of them say zero. And I'm like, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, and it's probably the last thing they want to hear. You know, they're like, <laughs> teach me some tricks. I want to sing lower. And I'm like, okay, well, first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to develop the entirety of, you know, the muscular system involved in producing mm -hmm. vocals. You know, I always um, compare it to uh, like skipping leg day in the gym. You know, it's like, you, same with your voice. Like you don't want to be like, you know, just jacked up top with chicken legs. Well, you got to do that with your, with your voice as well. You got to work out the entirety of your voice yeah. um, and make sure that it's evenly equipped. Um, so I always tell them, I'm like, listen, you gotta like go listen to Frankie Valley in the four seasons or listen to the beach boys and just start singing along with those guys that live in their falsetto. Um, and then once that is like, once you feel comfortable doing that, then we can start talking about the other stuff. That's a really, really fun suggestion too. And, um, for guys that have problems accessing that falsetto at first, any any tips for how to find the right sound? Not really, because I mean, if you're a true bass or even a true baritone, you should physiologically have the ability to access your falsetto. Now, mm -hmm. whether or not you have cultivated that at all is, a, is another story. Um, but you should 
be able to do it. You may not like how it sounds at first, um, <laughs> that. but you just do it. You just got to do it until you get out of your own head about how it sounds. Um, yeah. That's, that's super good advice. I think when I've worked with guys trying to develop a falsetto, the thing that makes them go away from it the most is that they don't think it's real singing. Sure. Right. And and so they'll sort of flinch back and say, wait, that was, that was okay. And I go, yes, develop yeah. it. Why yeah. didn't it? <laughs> and then you might have to squawk at first. That's fine. Like, yeah. you know, wait till you're in the shower or if you're alone in your car. And if you have to squawk, squawk. But um <laughs> Eventually, it'll start feeling more natural and you'll, you should be able to start lightening up and have a more airy, pleasant tone up there. Make weird noises. Yeah. That's one of my So, favorite. it's like most of these guys already have like the bottom somewhat cultivated. I'm like, all right, now I want you to cultivate this part and then we will meet in the middle. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. That's good. What yeah. about breath? Do you, do you think much about your breath? Only when I'm like performing at altitude. And then, and that does like sneak up on us sometimes. Yeah. You know, like you'll be halfway through the first song and you're like, what is going on? Oh, that's right. We're in Denver. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I've got to be more conscious about this. Right. Yeah. I, I know sometimes the um, stages will have oxygen on the side and places with high altitude. Have you ever it's encountered not, that? Not yet, but that's a wonderful <laughs> idea. It's, um, it's nice. <laughs> you know, that or when I'm, you know, doing something in the studio that, that requires like a really long, soft note or something. Mm. And then I will realize like, okay, I've been slipping a little bit. I got to get back in shape here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you're recording something where you're stacking your voice, do you record bottom up? Do you have a particular time of day when you like to record a certain part or anything like that? Um, not necessarily. Um, oftentimes I do just start in the morning because that's a good place to start. But, um, and I will oftentimes start with bass. Um, I think partially because it's strong in the morning. Um, but also just, I can do that. I can sing bass without batting an eye. I've been doing it for so long now. So it's like, <laughs> all right, let's lay down the, the baseline. Let's get the foundation. Um, and then let's go from there. And strangely, sometimes what I'll do is I'll do the bass part and then I'll do the high tenor part. Huh. Um, especially if it's like more of a, a more of a falsetto thing. Um, that's mm. just something I can mm. access all the time. And sometimes the falsetto is better before I've like warmed up my full voice range too much. Yeah. So I'll do the floaty falsetto stuff. And then from there, maybe jump back down to baritone and then work up to tenor two and then lead. And yeah. <laughs> that's cool. That, that's very cool. I know um, when I've been doing layering like that, uh, the recording order can be, I feel like it's important sometimes. If I recorded the track in the wrong order, I'll end up going back and re recording it. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, sometimes you have to do that anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes like I just did a, did a, a session yesterday. Um, there was like a three hour session for one song. Um, cause mm -hmm. I was demoing out a new chart that I was working on for, uh, me and Peter actually. Oh. And, um, and so by, by the end, you know, my voice was like pretty tired and I even told the, uh, my engineer, I'm like, I'll probably come back and redo some of this after I've rested. Yeah. Three and these do off songs. Time. The doo-wop songs are like a vocal workout. I mean, you've 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 heard them. It's like very rangy. I was I was very impressed. <laughs> Thank a you. lot of surprise. <laughs> Woo! It's good stuff. Thank well, you very much. You mentioned this uh, collaboration with Peter. You guys have done some really great collaborations together. I particularly loved Misty Mountains, um, just or Misty Mountain. I think that was the first one I heard. I just recently heard Green Sleeves. And you also just released a bunch of new ones, right? Yeah, we've got a couple more, I think, that came out recently. Yeah. 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 I want to know, because I see how well you guys work together. And I, I'm hearing more and more about um, different groups that you've worked with. What do you think makes a really good collaborator? Uh, well, first of all, side note. 
uh, Peter and I were in Ball in the House together for a few months in 2003. What? So that's how far we go back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Small world. Um, and then, you know, years <laughs> later, we, we ended up in the, the Singall family together as well. Um, what makes a good collaborator? Uh, fearlessness. Um, uh, you know, like minimal ego. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, probably those two things are, are, are way up there for me. That's awesome. Yeah. And I, I love that with green sleeves, you guys did it in one take with the, with the video. Yeah. That was very impressive. Got to get, get that sunset just right. Yeah. And also that's the time you've got. <laughs> so do it. Absolutely. That shows a certain fearlessness of we can do this yeah. in one take. We don't need any extra help. We're going to do it. Yeah. I think if you look closely, there might even be like a, a hint of a car on the edge of one of the shots. Hmm. One, yeah. But um, so good. yeah, I mean, like one thing I really appreciate with Peter uh, and you, um, and it's something I've tried to do in my career is just generosity um, and, you know, sharing the, the spotlight with other talented people. Um, that's why, you know, if you, if you go to one of my solo shows, it'll never say Tim Faust. It always says Tim Faust and friends. If you go to my Patreon campaign, it says Tim Faust and friends are creating things mm -hmm. because I know so many incredibly talented people that more people should know about. Yes. And so that's such a joy to me to uh, introduce my fans to other artists that I admire, as well as being able to collaborate with these people. Um, and it's something that I, I really appreciate that you and Peter both do as well. Thank you. And, and yeah. thank you for doing that too. That's yeah, absolutely. fantastic. And speaking of your Patreon, uh, that's where people can hear extra recordings as well from you that you've not released anywhere else. Yeah, that's very true. Um, I've been doing it since just a couple of months into the pandemic. So I guess we're at like a year and a half now um, of me releasing on average two projects a month. Um, and right now, all that stuff is living exclusively on Patreon. Um, in fact, that's kind of how I underwrote the, uh, the doo-wop album. I sort of released them one track at a time on there. So if you're really itching to hear this doo-wop stuff, uh, a lot of it's already available on Patreon. I love that. I love that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, oh yeah, Patreon is such a wonderful, uh, wonderful platform of supporting artists. Of Game changer for Home Free. Looks, oh yeah, totally. Yeah. Absolutely. And huge during the pandemic for so many artists as well. Yeah. I mean, it almost single-handedly kept us afloat, really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have some questions from some patrons in just a bit, but I want to get to just a couple more over here. Um, it's been so fun. I, I, I usually have a really long list of questions and we've been able to steer around them and here and there. So it's, ah, it's easy to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> Back at you. So uh, I wanted to know a little bit about um, the recording process for Home yeah. Free. You were saying you're in different cities, and I know, I believe that each of you has a custom modeling mic, right? Yeah, this guy right here, the Slate modeling mic, oh, uh, which slate. is which is new, which is new to us. Um, <laughs> whenever the pandemic hit, the first thing uh, we wanted to figure out was how we could continue to make music for people yeah. um because a we have this really as you now know this really rabid fan base um and uh you know they they had been so good to us on patreon um for so many years that we wanted to continue giving them stuff um you know and so many people needed a distraction from 2020 too mm -hmm. um so we really leaned on our producer, Darren Rust, who is uh, one fourth of the blenders as well and is the uh, main arranger for Home Free these days. He's an absolute genius, um, <laughs> the honorary sixth <laughs> member of Home Free. In fact, after this, I'll send you some of the demos that he's done for us because he's also a freak and has a giant range. And when he arranges something for us, he records all the parts and then sends oh them God. to us. 
And some of those are honestly better than our version when we get done. <laughs> so I'll send you wow. some of some of his stuff. But um, more people need to know about about Darren Rust. He's the best arranger I know. One of the best vocalists I know. Mix engineer, master. I mean, he just like does it all. Wow. Uh, and he's available. So check out skylandstudio.com. You won't be sorry. I'm going to um, look him up. <laughs> but we uh, we asked him, we're like, okay, what, what do we, how do we figure out how to record from our houses? Mm -hmm. um, and so he said, first of all, I want you guys all to get a slate modeling mic. I want you to get an Apollo twin, uh, which is the audio <laughs> interface we use. Yeah. Got that right there. Um, <laughs> and then we got a couple of uh, uh, types of software. One is Splashtop, which allows him to control our computers. And then Source Connect, which allows us to actually um, speak back and forth from his studio to our studio. And by studio, I mean this bedroom I'm in right now. <laughs> um, and so we all got that stuff. Now, um, Rob, Adam does his beatboxing from home already. Rob still goes over to Darren's studio to record because they live about mm -hmm. 10 minutes away from each other. Yeah. Um, and Darren has a, an incredible studio in the basement of his house in, in Lakeville, Minnesota. Nice. Um, but Austin, Chance, and I all got this, this remote setup. And it's wonderful for someone like me who knows almost as little as possible about the recording process. Um, cause I just turn on my computer and make sure the internet's working well. And then it starts moving on its own magically. Uh, <laughs> And then I go into a closet that I've retrofitted to be, you know, an ISO booth. Mm -hmm. And Darren starts talking to me through here. And I talk to him through here. And it's not dissimilar from being in a studio. We'll probably never go back to booking recording studios because it doesn't, doesn't make sense anymore. You know, they're expensive. We don't really need them. And again how we do this now is so similar to how we do it in studios. You know, Darren's usually in the, you know, the console room anyway, and we're usually in an isolation booth. Sometimes you can see him, sometimes you can't, but most of, uh, you know, most every interaction happens back and forth between the microphone and the headphones anyway. Mm -hmm. So that's how it's working now. It's just, now I can do it in my underwear. It's wonderful. Right. Hey, PJ's time. Yeah. We never need to record in jeans again. <laughs> never. No. I love that. I love that aspect of being able to record at home. I also yeah. find great joy in being able to roll out of bed and go sing the lowest notes I'm going to have all day long. <laughs> it's just I, know all, I know all about that. <laughs> oh, it's so cool. And uh, as far as timing things, you don't have to deal with any sort of lag or anything like that. No, I mean, every once in a while, you'll get a little bit of that. But at this point in time, um, you know, we've we've got a year and a half of troubleshooting now and we've mm -hmm. all upgraded our our Wi-Fi. Um, so we've got it really smoothed out now. Um, sometimes if you've been doing a long section, I'll notice that his talk back will get a little choppy uh -huh. um, and then we'll just disconnect, reconnect and it's like new again. Oh, that's awesome. It's really wonderful, yeah. Okay, that they answered so many questions for me about how you're handling the tech shift, and uh, really exciting. Also, Slate is that's such a cool microphone. It's incredible, and I again I know so little about it, but all the gearheads I know are so jazzed about this thing. Uh, yep. Darren is just ecstatic about it. We've been using it for a couple of years now, and it's still he still gets excited about it. You know, when he mm -hmm. throws a new modeling software on there, and it sounds like his dream mic, he just gets giddy. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Oh, that's cool. And, and for anyone who's watching who, you know, has my degree of knowledge, basically what it is, is you, you just need one microphone and then you can use modeling software that in other words, models after some of like a wide variety, almost any microphone you can think of for a fraction of the price. Um, so, you know, you almost just need the one mic and then regardless of what kind of recording you're going to do on it, you can just change it to a different modeling software to emulate what you want. Yep. Yeah. Really, really useful for people that are doing a lot of post too. Yeah. On their sound and aren't quite sure what kind of mic sound they would like to use. Yeah. And I think he even uses different 
types of mics, uh, you know, across the various like doo stuff I do. Mm. I think he like has, you know, one he likes for the lower stuff and something else he likes mm-hmm. for some of the higher stuff. So all that's oh, totally. over my head, but I'm very happy that it exists. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I could see, especially when you're doing stuff that's just stacking your own voice, having different mics that you're using for that can sort of separate the sounds just a little bit too. Whereas yeah. um, if it all sounds the same, it's harder. It can become mushier. Yeah. Ah, that's cool. That's yeah, it's cool. really cool. Yeah. Ah, that was smart, man. <laughs> well, and I mean, you know, that part was fairly seamless. The tricky part was figuring out how to film ourselves for music video purposes. Um, that was that was the hardest part. Um, you know, so we leaned on Darren for the audio side, and then uh, we leaned on uh, Jimmy Bates for the video side, who's done mm-hmm. so many of our videos for the last well, eight years now. Mm -hmm. Um, And he really talked us through getting the equipment we would need to film ourselves at a high enough quality, basically on our phones. Um, But every time we do a video, we were also filming that remotely in our homes. And so we would hop on Skype with him and he would work us through the lighting. That's the trickiest part. (gasps) Yeah. So he told us what kind of lighting stuff to buy. In mm-hmm. fact, I've got a ring light on right now. Nice. Um, and he would work with, you know, angles on that. We got, you know, some various backdrops and stuff that we could use. And mm-hmm. that was the the trickiest part. Um, but it saved him a lot of headache in the, in the long run because he's got to edit these five different videos together and make them look cohesive. Yeah. Yeah. And our patrons were so uh, patient and supportive and and accepting of this new, not as exciting style of video. Um, But again, they were just happy to get get new material during a pandemic. Yeah. I think it is wonderful that people can still create videos. They might not be the same awesome that was before, but they're just a different kind of awesome. For sure. Yeah. And I mean, it kind of made us be extra creative and uh all the videographers videographers we work for are phenomenal and i couldn't believe that they were able to keep coming to the table with new fresh ideas and make Mm -hmm. those you know phone recorded videos like look different from one another Mm -hmm. it's really cool that's really cool yeah totally ah man so many challenges but obviously um overcome in a really good way yeah. And it gave us a new appreciation too for how spoiled we truly are in a traditional <laughs> year. You know, now yes. that we get to get back together and actually have a team of people to make our music videos look really good, we're, there's just a new appreciation for that. Yeah. Yeah. That feeling of the the singing together in person. Yeah, for yeah. sure. It's, it's special. It is. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have a few Patreon questions here that I'd like right. to ask. Um, I told you we have some some big fans. So Stan Johnston wants to know, what is your favorite holiday tradition that comes from Jenica's side of the family that you've incorporated into their holiday tradition at the Faust Marion household? Um, <laughs> I love it. Uh, <laughs> we haven't incorporated too much like into what we do. My uh, All of my in-laws live here in Nashville now. So we just go oh. over there. Uh, for Christmas, which is really cool, but they they do Christmas fondue, which is nothing I'd ever heard of before. But now it's something I look forward to on the years that I spend it here in Nashville with the Marians. Is it just yeah. chocolate? No, it's it's all of, it's like all of the above. It's like you know, there's cheese dip and um, you know, it's like all of these uh, kebabs basically, and you can. You know, you're cooking it. They have all these different, it's almost like going to the melting pot or something where they have all these different cauldrons on the table and you can, you know, cook shrimp or chicken or beef. And then there's a variety of sauces as well that you can choose. It's really fun. That sounds really fun. I want to try that. (laughs) Um, Now at our house, we have a a new tradition where Jenica and I, I'm not even kidding. We go to Waffle House on Christmas. (laughs) So I guess... uh, Guess I've rubbed off on her. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> and soon we will have a, a cornbread dressing tradition. Yeah, as well. I will be I will be adding that to uh <laughs> to the Marian Thanksgiving for sure. Aw. Aw. That's cute. Malcolm H wants to know, 
in a Tim's story time way. Do you have a home free holiday story from the band's last holiday tour? See, that's going to be hard to remember because that's been a few years back now. Wow. Yeah. Um, I guess that would have been December of 2019 and my, my memory is terrible. Um, I mean, honestly, what, what comes to mind is not, uh, is not the most recent one, but the very first Christmas tour I did with those guys. Mm -hmm. Cause again, remember that I'm from Southeast Texas. I didn't see snow till I was 20. <laughs> and then at this point, I'm also living in Orange County, California, where it's yeah. just perfect year round. All year round. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I have agreed to do a Christmas tour in the Midwest. So I end up in, uh, I think it was Grand Forks, North Dakota. See the Grand Forks or Dickinson, North Dakota. It was one of those two cities. Um, and I'm wearing cowboy boots like an idiot. <laughs> not, not, a lot of, not a lot of tread on the bottom. Uh, and at the time, we toured in a conversion van and pulled a trailer that was way too big for that vehicle. Uh, and all of that got stuck on the ice. Oh. And so I get out to go help try to push it off. And I do like a cartoon style, <laughs> like feet come out from under me, like a slow motion. One of these, you know, it's like all of a sudden you see the stars. <laughs> and then I just landed on my back on ice. And I thought, <laughs> I've made a huge mistake. <laughs> that was good. Oh, yeah. yeah. I I used to do a lot of swing dancing and, you know, there's a, like flips and things in there. And I remember doing a particular aerial where my partner was wearing cowboy boots at the time. And partway through it, he, the cowboy boots, they don't have a tread, right? And he slipped. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I remember landing, uh, I think it was my fingernail or something that cut my chin open. Uh. All right. And, and, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Yeah, Cowboy folks, boots are slippery. This is a PSA, okay? If you're going to be swing dancing or doing anything on ice, don't don't wear cowboy boots. No cowboy boots. <laughs> That's fun. Dwayne Towns wants to know. Oh, this this is such an interesting question that I didn't get into because I wanted his to to get into it anyhow. Does it bother you or any of your current bandmates that you guys had to shift to brand yourselves as a country group in order to catch more attention? And is there any desire to drift back away from the category now that you've achieved those goals? Okay, this could be another long answer if that's okay. Oh yeah, yeah, because okay. I think the branding of Home Free and especially how you shifted that before the sing-off, um, when yeah. you guys really went big there, that's it's fascinating to me. So yes. Okay, so let's back up all the way to uh, when I'm in Southern California. So <laughs> probably like 2000, eight or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, what I didn't touch on earlier was that uh, I was mostly focused on writing pop music, like organic piano based pop music. Oh, um, uh, I grew up on a mixture of oldies and gospel and country, obviously in Southeast Texas. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I was singing Garth Brooks for the talent shows and the whole thing. I mean, I like country was in my bones. I absolutely loved it. But then there came a time in my formative years where I sort of viewed that as like my parents' music, hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, and what they didn't listen to at all was pop music. So I was like, okay, here's this new to me style of music that can be my music. And so there was a stretch of time there where I thought I wanted nothing to do with country music. Whoa. Yeah. I did not um, see that coming. Yeah. And so, uh, I, uh, when I first started writing and recording out in uh, LA, it was more, more, uh, pop stuff. And then one day the guy I worked for, he came in and he said, uh, I have struck up a deal with song pluggers in Nashville. So I pretty much need you to start exclusively writing country music. Whoa. And I was not excited about this at all. Um, Again, no disrespect to country music and country music fans. Like, I absolutely love country music. I, it, it was one of my first loves, and I have fallen in love with it all over again. But there was a stretch of time there where I thought I didn't want anything to do with it. And so when I learned about this, I was not happy. I, to be honest with you, I, I went home and 
drank an entire bottle of Jack Daniels and then <laughs> and then wrote the most redneck song I could possibly think of. <laughs> Which was? My thought at the time was, you know, after I write this almost a caricature of a country song, just writing a, a normal contemporary or pop country song after this won't feel so bad. <laughs> to this day, it is my most popular original. Oh, no. <laughs> and it's one of Home Free's most popular originals because we ended up doing a version of it later. And it's called Champagne Taste on a Beer Budget. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, my throat dried up and my heart just sunk as she motioned me over and popped the trunk and I tried to ignore her absent-minded smile. And boy, I was greeted by quite the crew. There's Louis Vuitton and some Jimmy Choo, and that was just the fellas who were sitting on top of the pile. I said, baby, there's a Walmart a block away, and I don't think they sell these brands. So, so I, I ended up writing country music for about a year or so. And uh, I was singing the demos and the guy that I was working for was like, you're really good at this. Like, why don't you be a country artist? And I was mm -hmm. like, cause I have no interest in doing that. That's why. So we went back and forth for a few months. And then one day he comes in and he just says, I've decided I'm not going to pay you anymore unless you be a country artist. Wow. And I was like, okay, I guess I'm a country artist now. <laughs> um, and so we kind of polished up some of the songs I had already been writing. And then I spent the next few months writing the second half of this now knowing it was going to be a country project. Um, and so even the, you know, some of the fans have that early EP and they can hear early versions of these songs. They were already a little leaning country. Let's be honest. I mean, it's like what I'm most suited to do, but the, I just hadn't committed to it yet. Uh -huh. uh, and then they, then you get the second version on, my album, The Best That I Can Do, which is also available at timfowlsmusic.com. And then three of those songs even ended up on the album Crazy Life by Home Free, the first album we released after the sing-off. Um, but it's just so funny because there were so many signs along the way telling me I should be making country music. And I was so resistant to that for whatever reason. Um, I, I ended up leaving this solo country career to join home free who at the time were just a contemporary pop acapella group like most of the other ones mm -hmm. um and incidentally they ended up having me sing some country stuff just because it tends to suit uh, a bass vocalist um and so we weren't even connecting the dots that every time we did a country song is home free it got the biggest reaction yeah, we just, we, I don't know, we were just doing our thing and being ignorant. So uh, we did a, a version of, well, let's see. So let's, let's fast forward to Austin joins the group and he mm -hmm. is country as cornbread. Oh. So oh, yeah. <laughs> when he, this is not even an exaggeration. When he first joined the group, he's from Georgia. And uh, I think there's also something about like the, uh, the lower frequencies of my voice that sort of helped to drown out the Southern drawl a little bit. But something about a, a a country tenor, I mean, it's just there's no avoiding that. So, oh. so he would when he first got in the group, he would say things, and the rest of Home Free would all turn and look at me, and I would translate. <laughs> That's a hundred percent true story. That happened for months, <laughs> months. But uh, and so uh, <laughs> once. Cute. So again, Home Free was already doing some country stuff mm -hmm. just because A, it lends itself so well to acapella. There's a lot of harmony that's tend to built into country stuff. Um, B, they were featuring me on a Josh Turner song because it was just a good mm -hmm. bass feature. Um, and then when Austin came in, you know, he brought even more of a country flair to what we do. Um, and now that Adam Chance is in the band, the Southerners actually outnumber the Minnesotans and, you know, he grew up in Alabama. So it's like, we now have three country boys in the band. Um, so it was a real natural progression, but 
again, when I first joined them, I sort of left a country gig to sing contemporary pop acapella. Um, but we went on, we went to audition for the sing off. It was home Free's fourth attempt. Um, they had auditioned every year. They had made it to the next to last round. They had signed all the paperwork. They just never got onto the actual show. Um, but now they have me in Austin and we, uh, we used to open up our shows with life is a highway, which is a rock song. Mm hmm. But everybody knows the Rascal Flats version these days. So it's sort uh -huh. of just become an honorary country song. But we weren't even thinking that. We're just like, it's a good opener. It's a, it, you know, we toss the leads around. It kind of showed everybody off. So you have to bring three songs to your sing off edition. So we open with Life is a Highway, not thinking that it's country. The second song is Your Man by Josh Turner, very country. But again, it's really more of a vehicle to show me off. Which mm -hmm. at that point in time, no one had really done on the sing off yet. They hadn't really like featured a bass lead vocalist. So we mm -hmm. thought that would set us apart. And the the producers stop us and they go, Hey, how would you guys feel about being like our like token country group? And we were like, We would feel not great about that. <laughs> and they were like, Okay, well, Here's the thing, that's that's a hook, and that is something that has never been done on the sing-off before. Whereas up to that point, everyone else for the most part was trying to do exactly what we were doing. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, it's it's the formula that Rockapella started and we're all still doing it, you know, 30 years later. Um and you know, traditionally, uh as an a cappella group, people do want to hear you put your own spin on songs they already know. Um, and early on when you're trying to win over audiences, you try to do a little bit of everything. So it's like, mm -hmm. here's some gospel, here's some pop, you know, here's an oldie, here's some country. You just try to do it all to appeal to everybody. Um, and so, so we sort of, our first two songs were accidentally country songs. And then the producers saw that potential and they were like, well, what was your third song going to be? Please don't say Jason Mraz or train. It was going to be a train song. And, uh, and they were like, no, we don't want to hear that crap. Um, they <sighs> said, do you guys do any other country stuff? And we thought about it and we we're like, well, we had learned a Garth Brooks song for a corporate gig a year before sang it one time. And that was it. And they said, go out in the hallway, polish that up, come back in and sing that for us. Oh, and wow. we did. And they said, we're 90% sure that if you guys commit to being a country band that you'll be on the show in front of 10 million viewers. Wow. So, you know, we went home and debated that for some time. And, uh, at the, at the end of the day, we just couldn't argue with that. Yeah. That level of, uh, publicity. And, and we, we also knew though, there was no going back. We were like, if we do this, we're just a country band from now on. Um, you know, because Home Free had been around for since the year 2000. So at this point in time, we're 13 years into the Home Free trajectory. And, and we knew that in one episode, we would be performing for more people than the entirety of the Home Free career up to that point. So we were like, are we doing this? Like, are we just a country band now? We're like, I, I guess so. And my biggest life lesson that I try to share with folks is listen to the universe and stay out of your own way. <laughs> because by the time Home Free auditioned for the sing-off, I had quit country music once. I had quit acapella music like four times. <laughs> I finally <laughs> gave in and did them both simultaneously and it got me a record deal in my 30s. <laughs> so right? kids, listen to the universe and stay out of your own way. <laughs> That was, that was a wonderful story. And I feel like that's some, <laughs> yes, yes, that's And perfect. I encourage you guys to go check out Champagne Taste on a Beer Budget. <laughs> you know, I've seen that one around. Uh, I honestly, I keep a lot of things available for first time reactions. So a lot of times if I've seen something, I'll, I'll kind of put in a holding pen, but I'm just going to go listen to that because I really want to hear it now. <laughs> it's definitely in, in the vein of uh, Hillbillies versus Zombies. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. 
<laughs> so good. All right, Jeff Chandler wants to know, this is a little bit long, so we'll get to the question at the end. He said, since your European tour wasn't passing near my home, I made plans to travel to one of the cities where you were performing. The UK and Austria were the two countries that were easiest to travel to. In the end, I chose to fly to the UK to catch the end of the European tour. Of course, the pandemic brought everything to an end around the time of the Austria show. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious, was my decision not to go to the Vienna show moot? Or did I miss my chance to see the last show before COVID shut everything down? Follow up. I know the planning is still tentative, but any ideas on when you might return to Europe? Um, well, first of all, we're, we're going to try so hard to get over there in 2023. Um, we're currently just playing catch up right now with all of our dates. Um, you know, we're, mm -hmm. we're still on the Dive Bar Saints tour and we've released two albums since that album. So we're, uh, we're Whoa. really playing catch up. Whoa. Um, we have all these U.S. dates um, and even Canadian dates uh, that we haven't done yet. So we're going to complete all of those uh, early, well, by mid next year. Uh, we're finally getting to Canada. Those, those folks have been so patient. Um, in, the, in the late spring, we'll get there. Um, and then we're going to try to get back to Europe in, uh, in 2023. Uh, but to answer your first question, yes, it would have been moot. Uh, because we didn't get to do that show in Vienna. Um, we were having breakfast in the venue and the crew was just about to go start setting up for the show. And the promoter came in and said, the government just pulled the plug on all, on all concerts. Um, so we looked at our schedule and, uh, it's like, well, okay, what do we, what do we do? Um, we were supposed to have two days off after that, followed by a show in Munich. Um, so we hightailed it to Munich um, where we could kind of like, you know, get into a hotel and just like assess how things were going. Um, and the, uh, the second night in Munich, we stayed up till 2 a.m. to watch the presidential address. And that's when he said they were going to be like, banning flights from europe soon yeah so we were like ah! delta first <laughs> flight home please yes um and we i mean we had uh we had like merch printed over there all our merchandise like you know it makes more mm -hmm. sense to print it instead of like mm -hmm. print it here and bring it with us so we had all of this merchandise that we had picked up there um when we do the davar saints tour we travel with an actual bar we put on stage with us we had that built there <laughs> Um, so we had just, nice. and, and, uh, just some, uh, equipment and stuff that we had rented for the tour uh -huh. and we had to figure out what to do with that at 3am. Oh. Um, my wife and I had all of our laundry at a wash and fold that didn't open before our flight out. So we literally, literally left all of our clothes, um, a lot of merchandise and even a full blown bar we just sat behind this venue in Munich. So it, I don't, it might still be there. If you want a piece of home free history, go see if the, the oh. Dive Bar Saints bar is still sitting behind that Munich venue. Oh my um, goodness. Yeah, it was pretty wild. I think, I think uh, some of our like Sony reps, uh, European Sony reps went and picked up some of the merchandise. But yeah, it was wild. Yeah. 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 I could see that being very wild. Thinking, like, it was it out. was dis you know it was disorienting because starting at two a.m. you're just like in this scramble, and then twenty four hours or so later you haven't slept much and we're sitting on our couch in Nashville knowing that I'm supposed to be doing a show in Germany right now, and instead I'm home, not even knowing if I can leave my house or knowing how long that's going to be. I mean, yeah. it was like it was whiplash. It was very bizarre. Yeah. So anyway, Eurofries, thank you for your patience. I am so sorry, especially those of you uh, in the UK, because we were so looking forward to those shows and we will get back as soon as we possibly can. Um, I know it's starting to get tricky again, but yeah, once this starts to blow over, I hope that some of you can come over here and, and, uh, and see a show in the States as well. Because, um, yeah, we miss we miss seeing y'all. I'm just looking forward to getting to see you guys perform too. <laughs> so, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. I, I feel very sure of that. 
Um, well, Quirky Uncle Dave wants to know, how would you approach an arrangement for a song differently if you're arranging it for Home Free versus arranging it for a solo recording where you would perform all the parts? Hmm. I don't know if I would approach it any differently, Ooh. to be honest with you. Um, you know, and unless, um, you know, when I'm, when I'm just doing solo acapella recordings, I don't worry as much about anchoring it in country. Um, hmm. you know, for example, you know, I've, I've got this whole album of doo-wop stuff coming yeah. out and, you know, I didn't really put much twang on the lead vocals or anything. You know, I kind of just, just saying like you would when you're singing doo-wop. Um, so there's certain things, you know, you do to anchor it in country. Mostly it's just, uh, it's mostly when you're acapella, it's mostly about how you sing the leads. Some of the bass lines, you know, might be a little more doom, 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 ba, doom, ba, doom, that kind of thing, you know, <laughs> if you're doing country. Um, but that that's about it. But But for the most part, I don't think I would do it any differently. Do you do beatbox too? A little bit, yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Cool, cool. I thought I heard, I heard a little bit, but I don't think I heard, um, I heard as much. So when you're sending, if you're arranging something for Home Free, do you just send uh, some skeleton or uh, skeleton beatboxing, or how would you do that? Not too much, honestly. That's the one thing you know, unless. Um, it's some sort of like unintuitive beat that we want to be. Um, we don't really touch it too much because we want Adam to bring so much of his own artistic expression to what we do. Um, he's, so creative. <laughs> he's, he's incredible. And he always takes our arrangement to, to a different level than they would otherwise, you know, if, mm -hmm. if we were, if we were programming, you know, the beatboxing, the way it would make sense to us. Like sometimes he brings such a fresh new perspective to it and it's, mm -hmm. it's really wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> That's something I really appreciate about, about home free too. Like no matter who takes lead on an arrangement, we like it when everybody injects a little bit of themselves into it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. For me, um, one of the most fun things that started to happen, I think because of really digging into a lot more of the I'd say bigger acapella, acapella music on YouTube um, is that I ended up doing some beatboxing lessons with Lane uh, from Voice Play, and uh, I've just had a new appreciation for it. It's yeah. Uh, I I think I didn't know how to distinguish between what's good or what's what's not as good before, and um, hearing some of the totally wacko sounds. Um, that Adam can come up with or Lane can come up with. It's, it's so much fun to hear these just, yeah. Their it's incredible. And, it, you know, <laughs> that is part of what makes what voice play does uniquely mm -hmm. voice play and what we do uniquely home free because they, yes. they bring their own flair to it. Totally. Yeah. Different yeah. styles and, and fun. Ugh. I mean, you so know, for cool. Pete's sake, we ended up doing like reggae Johnny Cash, you know. <laughs> And yes. so much of that is a, <laughs> is a credit to Adam Rupp. Um, yeah, when, when we were kind of woodshedding that arrangement, that's an arrangement I had done for us on the sing-off. Oh. Um, and interestingly enough, most of the, the background parts didn't change. I had already kind of arranged it that way, almost like poppier than anything. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, Deke Sharon came in and was like, all right, let's see like what, what more we can do to this to really like put a unique stamp on it. And we just started playing with different rhythms. And uh, as soon as mm -hmm. Adam threw like a reggae beat, we were like, whoa, I think that might be it. <laughs> it's one of those things where you're swinging for the fences. Like people are either going to dig it or they're going to really hate it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was a ring of fire one, right? Yeah. 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 That, uh... But that was such a turning point for us. Yeah, like great. artistically on the show, um, for sure, that's that's kind of like when we really felt the tide was turning and it's like, wow, we could win this thing. Um, mm. But when you take a big risk like that and it pays off, um, it's really rewarding and also gives you a sense of uh, more artistic license moving forward. Um, 
to experiment with some of these like iconic songs. Yeah. 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 It's fun. I really like it when there's a twist like that too. Yeah. Yes. All right. Last question from a patron here is from Melanie Thomas. She wants to know, there are a number of videos on YouTube comparing you with Avi Kaufman, Jeff Casalucci, and other bass singers. Is there any friendly rivalry between you all? Would you ever work together to produce a song as a bass super group? I think it could happen. Um, there's not much of a rivalry, you know, like some of the fans want that. The sing-off <laughs> definitely wanted that. And it's just, that's not really the nature of acapella music. Um, mm -hmm. I think because it already is so like familial, you know, just when you've got five vocalists already coming together to create music, um, you know, it's, it's already got such a, a sense of collaboration that that just extends to other groups and singers as well. Like we all just want to see each other do really well and we are fans of each other. Um, so no, it's not really a rivalry. And yes, uh, I think something could happen at some point. I've already got an idea that I would like to, I would like to see like an all bass, uh, super group for at least like one track. I've got, I've got an idea that will probably come to fruition at some point. <laughs> I, that would be huge. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's super, super awesome to think about. Especially when I think about like how much the room would shake. <laughs> yeah. And it'd be fun for me again to introduce uh, some of these bass enthusiasts to probably some names they've never heard before that are, you know, could make me sound like a alto. <laughs> I'd like to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> That's super fun. Well, um, thank you so much for answering so many questions. I want to know how we as a community here on the Charismatic Voice, all of all of our subscribers, fans, how can we support you the most? Is it uh, buying your merch? Is it joining your Patreon? Is it uh, listening to your songs on YouTube or Spotify? You know what? It's I feel like people often want to support artists, but they maybe aren't always aware of which avenue is the best way to support an artist. So tell us how. For me these days, I would say the best way would be Patreon. Um, I assume most of your viewers are familiar with that, but if you're not, that's p a t r e o n dot com slash Tim Faust Music. Um, that's that's probably the best way right now. Uh, I will have more stuff coming out soon, uh, available to stream as well as some music videos on YouTube. But right now, I don't have too much of that stuff. Um, you know, I sort of launched a Patreon campaign because I had no good excuse to not do that anymore. You know, I suddenly had all this time on my hands, um, you know, two Februarys ago. So I thought, you know, I should get around to doing some of these projects that I've always had on the back burner. And, and, uh, and Patreon was a, was a vehicle for that. Um, but it's sort of taken on a life of its own. And now we're actually doing a bunch of Tim Faust and friends shows, um, which that's something I can mention as well. Uh, if you go to timfaustmusic.com, uh, there's a, there's a way that you can actually bring Tim Faust and friends to your backyard, literally. It's a concept that my manager brought to me during the pandemic. And it was, it was a way to bring live music safely to people who were desperately missing it. Mm -hmm. Um, so along with, you know, this remote recording setup, I, I bought a little band in a box setup that'll fit in my car and some buddies and I started literally driving all over the country and setting up in people's backyards and having socially distant concerts for them. And it's been so much fun. I love it. So it's something we're going to keep doing moving forward. So if you want to, uh, hire Tim Faust and friends to come play in your backyard, you can do that at Tim Faust music. Dot com. Uh, if you're interested in a one-on-one -on -one bass workshop with me, you can do that at timfaustmusic.com. Uh, and something else that my manager brought to me that's been such a joy is these personalized shout-out videos on something called My Fan Park. Um, used to be Starsona. It's similar to Cameo. Um, but these days, I kind of prefer My Fan Park. And 
yeah, I mean, 90% of the time, it's just me singing happy birthday to, to, <laughs> to somebody or their kids or whatever. Um, but you know, it just, it brings people joy. It brings me joy and it's, it's a really fun thing. So if you know a, a Tim Faust super fan and you want to send them a one of a kind gift, we got Christmas coming up. So I, you know, I could wish Merry Christmas to somebody for you. You can figure that out at myfanpark.com slash Tim Faust music. And we will put links to all of that below in the about section of this video too. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, that's, uh, I love how many things you're doing. I love, uh, You've had your fingers in so many more pies than I even knew. Um, and it's also, it's just really fun to connect about, about food. I love food. I love <laughs> food too. Yeah. yeah. Do I got to ask you, did you ever, did you know like how vast the world of acapella music was? And did you, mm -hmm. did you ever have any idea that it was going to be like such a big part of what you do? Um, yeah. To, okay. to a degree, I, I grew up. Um, I grew up with a lot of acapella music around me. It wasn't contemporary though. It was um, my grandpa and uncle sang in a the Living Waters Quartet, and uh, they would often do sort of almost like revivalist kind of mm -hmm. services as a barbershop barbershop quartet. And then uh, I really brought that into my life by singing in a trio all throughout high school and I I still wish that I would have continued doing more acapella like that but I really went the opera route and I feel that uh, the opera route had a very particular kind of training that doesn't work very well in an acapella group I needed to focus on that for a while but I might go back to acapella groups at some point all right well I've always <laughs> wanted to do a version of uh the Bach Gounod Ave Maria, like an all acapella version of that. So, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll track the backgrounds and let you oh, put your man. operatic stamp on the lead. If you ever want to do something that's super classical and, and go that direction with some, some tracking guests, I would totally be down. <laughs> all right. All right. Good to know. Yeah. Super fun. But thank you again for your time and um, let's cheers. Cheers. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the tea. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.